it's hard for someone addicted to alcohol to hold down a nine to five job working at McDonald's flipping hamburgers, much less construct an ark to save humanity from a flood that's never happened. So that stopped me for a moment in my tracks. And I said, no, as an alcoholic, you know, and, and it, it bothered me for a minute because I said, I, you know, things started popping in my mind like, if Noah was a drunkard, how did he know God was talking to him? Because, you know, I've seen some people, the alcoholics, you know, <laughs> you were just asleep in my dog's food bowl the other night drooling, and now you're telling me you were talking to God last night. You know, did this, did, you know, to rationally, that would not make sense to me. That's like, you know, an alcoholic on the street coming to you and tell you God's talking to him. You know, he has no, th this would give this man no validity. Th th this man has no validity with anyone. So, I didn't pay it too much attention. It caught me, but I said, you know what, I'm going to keep going. Because there's one thing that you don't do in Christianity, and I'll tell you what it, was, it is in a minute when I started doing it. Um, then I came across the story of Lot or Lut alayhi salam. And we all know the story of Sodom and Gomorrah in, in these stories, but there's a, another very twisted story in the Bible about Lot and his daughters. There's a story of Lot and his daughters uh, uh, in, in, in the Bible that says his daughters got him drunk one night and seduced him and committed incest with him. This is, the Bible, this is one of the Bible portrayals of the prophets of God. The person who saved, saved, uh, 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 or, or saved his family from Sodom and Gomorrah. This is the story that is in the Bible. So I'm catching myself again, like, oh, this is becoming a really uh, bad habit that I'm seeing. This is becoming a bad recurrence that I'm seeing over and over again in this Bible. So, you know, after that I started, you know, speeding through some of the other mumble jumble to get to more of these prophet stories. And I got to the story, there, there, there are others, and there are some stories in the Bible that are not PG rated, period. They're not rated for talking anywhere. You know, you would need a, 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 an 18 and up ID card to be able for me to even tell you these stories. So uh, the one that tree intrigued me, the, uh, that caught my attention the most, was of my most beloved story in the Bible, and that was of David and Goliath. Uh, that was my most intriguing story to me because not only was, you know, it said that in the Bible that David was a very small man and Goliath was a very big man, and that was appealing to me because I was oh, I've always been very short, and as a kid I was really short. So, you know, I said, uh, this was a very beautiful story to me just in its prose and in, in, in its concept of overcoming. And so I started to read about David. And there are be very beautiful stories about David in the Bible. There are indeed. But there is one story about David in the Bible that shocked me to my core. And it's a story about three people. There's three people in, in, in this drama. David, Bathsheba, and Uriah. And... It says that David saw, uh, saw this woman named Bathsheba, and she was one of the most beautiful women of her time. Uh, and she happened to be married to one of the commanders of his army named Uriah. But David on this day decided that he was not able to resist his temptation uh, to be with this woman Bathsheba, so he did. Uh, and he committed adultery with her. And knowing that he did this, he, that the, the way that he decided to cover it up was he sent a letter to the generals of his army saying that when the battle was fierce for everyone to pull back and abandon Uriah uh, so that he would be killed and when he dies then he could have Bathsheba no harm no foul so David went from being the slayer of Goliath the hero for man to uh, an adulterer a, a, a plotter and a murderer and so this is when I really caught myself and said hold on now Something's wrong here. Something's got to give. I said because to me, God's prophets in my mind were people of example. People who I could follow as an example. Someone who was supposed to be the best of us so that we could follow them and emulate them. And I'm, they're turning out to be worse than some of the people that you see on America's Most Wanted. David is somebody that if I only knew this about him from the Bible, I see him coming down the street. I'm going the other way and calling 911 because he has to have a warrant out on him for something. This is what I'm thinking in my mind. This man is not an honorable man at all. He, he okay, he killed Goliath, yeah, but he killed this other guy named Uriah to be able to commit adultery with his wife. So I, I, I did. I committed the cardinal sin in Christianity. I started asking questions. Um, this is the one thing you do not do in Christianity is you don't ask questions, especially not about issues like this. Um,
So I went to my pastor and I started asking questions. You know, what, what's going on here? You know, pastor, there's, there's a, a very bad recurring uh, habit about these men in the Bible. What is, what is the deal here? And I remember he told me the same thing that I, almost every pastor or every evangelist or anyone I talked to about this, same, same, same answer, almost like it was programmed. They would put their hand on my shoulder and say, Brother Joshua, don't let a little bit of knowledge wreck your faith. Because you're not justified by knowledge, you're justified by faith. Uh, and they would quote me verses like, lean not on understanding, you know, Paul's, we're justified by faith in Jesus Christ. You know, this is all, they would quote this whole line of thing to me like it was already pre-programmed, they, like they programmed in pastor school that people are going to ask you questions and here's the answer. Um, so, you know, I said to myself, you know, I don't know, pastor, you know, this just seems kind of odd. He said, let me tell you something. Uh, what you're reading is the Old Testament referring to God's covenant with the children of Israel. Uh, and they were a different people, a very stubborn, crazy people. Uh, so, why don't you move on to the New Testament? Uh, in the New Testament, you'll find the new covenant they were under with Jesus Christ, and I promise you things will change and be better. I said, okay, perfect. So I read all the, went ahead and finished and got to Malachi, and then started with the New Testament. So I, you know, I opened the New Testament, I said, two things will change and be better. I said, okay, perfect. So I read all the, went ahead and finished and got to Malachi and then started with the New Testament. So I, you know, I opened the New Testament and I said, here we go. You know, let's start all over again. But there were a few things that I had learned from the Old Testament that, that, that I wanted to keep in mind when I started to read the New Testament. I learned, number one, that God was one in a unique sense. This is what I learned from the Old Testament, that God was one in a singular, unique sense sense. This is over and over and over and over very clearly in the Bible. God's nature is one. This is so clear through the Old Testament and that he was very jealous about his worship. And every single time the children of Israel would turn to something else other than him, he would punish them and restrict their lifestyle. This is something that I learned. And it kind of, sim the similitude to me with how God dealt with the children of Israel was and I hate to use this stark, contra uh, this stark contrast, but it's almost as if one of, uh, one of us went out, God forbid, I hope not, and let's say we went out here and, and robbed a bank. You rob a bank, you're going to jail for a long time. And every day when you wake up, do you think that that jail is going to look like the, the, the Hilton at LAX? No, I, I, I doubt it. It's probably dark, cold, bad food, orange jumpsuits, not nice people, the whole nine yards. And the reason why this is, and I know this now from studying psychology, is that this is supposed to be a stark reminder every single day when this person wakes up that you are in jail. This is supposed to remind them every single day you're in jail because you committed a crime. And we run this, not you. This is the message that is being portrayed to this person in jail. So when the children of Israel kept rebelling against God, he restricted their lifestyle. If you study Judaic law now, it is some of the most strict religious law you can find. All of the good things that we enjoy as Muslims, even when it comes to dietary laws, like the good parts of the meat that we are allowed to eat, they can't have these things. These are things that are restricted from them. Why? Because God, Allah, wanted to remind them every day that I am Allah. I am your God. You will worship me. I run this. Not you. And I understood this from reading the Old Testament. This is a concept I had come across. So I started with the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And one other thing that I did when I started to read the Bible was, if you go to Barnes & Noble, let's say you go to Barnes & Noble and you take a book off the shelf, what is usually the first thing you look at? The title. Then the next thing, the author. You want to know the title and the author. What is the name of the book? Who wrote it? Um, and if you do this test with every single uh, um, book of the Bible, you get a title and no author. Author unknown. Or author is, uh, uh, appears to be so-and-so. Or we derive that so-and-so possibly written this. You know, like, let's just say for Exodus, they say Moses wrote Exodus. Uh, which if you read some of, Mo uh, of Exodus, he couldn't have written all of Exodus. Uh, because the last part of Exodus is Moses' death, burial, and Joshua taking over the children of Israel. Now, unless Moses was a sure indeed prophet that was able to write things after he died then he did not write these things. And so when you go to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, I wanted to know Matthew who? Mark who? Luke who? John who? Because it's called the Gospel according to Matthew. The bad thing is that no one knows. 
No one knows because no one pinned their name down to these things. No, no Bible scholar in his right mind will tell you that we know for sure Matthew so-and-so wrote this, Mark so-and-so wrote this, Luke so-and-so wrote this, John so-and-so wrote this. It's, not, it's, it's factual information that we do not know who wrote these. So I was intrigued. I'm like, hmm, that doesn't, you know, why would somebody write this book that's supposed to be passed down over generations and people are supposed to, this is the inspired word of God to guide mankind and nobody decided to write, pin down who wrote it. But anyway, I started to read it and I started to notice things about the teachings of Jesus Christ. Uh, and they were not what I had learned in church. Uh, when Jesus spoke, he spoke of the nature of God. And when he spoke of the nature of God, it was the same nature of God that I found in the Old Testament. Jesus said uh, uh, many times that God is one. God is unique. He, he would even quote from the Hebrew scriptures. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is but one. Uh, when he was asked what is the greatest commandment, or the, he was asked the greatest commandment, he said the greatest commandment, and every Muslim should understand these two concepts. This should be nothing new to you. Uh, the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your might, with all your strength, and then to love your neighbor as you love yourself. He said the rest hang on these two, which we know ha we, in Islam we have rights of the creator and rights of the creation. Uh, so this was the concept that he was teaching. And he even, was, he even said in 1 John 5 to 17, and this was more clear to me than anyone else, anything else can be, this is life eternal, that they may know you, the only true God, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. And when you look at that in the Greek and the Aramaic, it is almost exactly to a T of La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. Now that I know Arabic and have understood that, very same similar statements. Yes, indeed, there were some implicit statements uh, about that you could implicitly, if you took them and separated them from everything else, you could maybe derive that Jesus was trying to claim some divinity or, or something for himself. But I also know from doing psychology, and I did a little bit of law too, that an implicit statement cannot override an explicit statement. An explicit statement always takes precedence. So if Jesus said God is one, and he anagorically may have alluded to God being more than one, then the clear statement overrides that each and every single time. Um, so this is what I found through the, through the New Testament. And I also found that Jesus taught salvation. But his salvation that he taught was obeying God and following the commandments. This was his mode of salvation. One man asked him, good master, tell me how I, inha I can in inherit the eter uh, eternal life. He said, follow the commandments. Follow the commandments. He even, in Matthew, was so seer, sincere about it. He said, whosoever shall follow the least of these commandments and teach men to do so shall be called the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall break the least of these commandments and teach men to do so shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. So this I understood very clearly that Jesus taught the same nature of God that was in the Old Testament. He taught that the, the salvation lied in worshiping God and following the commandments. This I understood. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were very clear about this. You know, there were other things, the only begotten son, you know, but these things were not in red letters, so I did not give them as much weight as what I did to the actual words that Jesus Christ was saying out of his own mouth. Um, so, I read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. All of it was 